Dave Attell, who I had not met before, so it was fun to spend some time talking to him. I think he's a brilliant comic. I think his latest special, Hot Cross Buns, is something I'd highly recommend. He's he's uh, an incredible joke writer. And, um, you know, just getting to know how self-deprecating he is about himself and how humble he is about himself. We tried to kind of <laughs> prop him up a little bit. Yeah. But he's, he's super smart and funny, David. Yeah, we give him actual awards he's won and things he's done and he doesn't yeah. he disregards them. But yeah, I've always heard positive about Attell. We overlapped a little bit on Sunny Live because uh, he was a writer. He came in mm-hmm. to write, I think, around Sarah Silverman year and Jay Moore, he said. Uh, but got into that grind. He's a comedian guy. He, he's always been someone that really loves that more than being a performer as far as sitcoms or whatever. That wasn't his lofty goal. Loved old comics like Mitch Hedberg, Bill Hicks. So uh, he talks about that. He talks about how long a special would be. Uh, how to name a special we got into a lot of lot of interesting things and a very very nice guy yes he's a as far as stand ups and if you talk to stand ups they'll always mention Attell mm-hmm. uh cuz Dave Chappelle two days <laughs> but they'll always mention Attell as one of the greats and i think he truly is um he's so unassuming about it uh and vulnerable actually but yeah comedy central kind of was a big part of his career that's very interesting and his Mm. time on snl and the way he thinks going forward in his career so i would just keep driving if you're driving or if you're shopping or if you're gardening just keep doing what you're doing and press play yeah i'd say if you're in the supermarket listening in your earphones pull the cart over in the produce section and just listen don't get unfocused by cantaloupes or anything just yeah if you're squeezing some french bread and going is this stale Right at that moment, <laughs> press press play. Squeezing French bread going, I just broke my finger. This one's too hard. When did this uh, get into the store? <laughs> <laughs> okay, here he is. Attell. Hey, can you hear me? Even worse, I can see you. At least recognize my presence. Guys, hello, fellas. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> You know, Dana, I just saw <laughs> Mr. Attell. We'll talk about his special in a minute, but I just saw him at Kill Tony. You know, he's the wrong guy to do it with. He's too funny. I, they should have thrown me some sucker, you know? Yeah, some... what happened there? Because p- people told me that you just didn't talk. <laughs> Who, me? What, what, what was with Spade at Kill Tony? That's what I got from my people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not even a welcome to the show. Just jump right in. Oh, okay. for you? There's there's yeah. no welcome here. We get right to the gossip. It's kind of like it's it's like it's always going like eternal. I guess. Well, it. we do like we'll do a 20 minute interview where we'll just talk and, and <laughs> Oh yeah. We inter- we we do an intro after you leave, so it's like coming and then up. it's like oh, our, our guest coming up. So yeah. I get it. As we used to call it as first. I get it. How do you not have a podcast or you don't want i don't have a podcast that's why i'm excited you guys look a little jaded but (laughs) it was fun doing phil tony with dave Mm -hmm. i've always been a fan of dave and uh to say the to say uh i'm just gonna say it i think he classed up the show you know yeah he put a fresh paint on it i thought it was really great that he was a part of it yeah we definitely had fun i had fun with it it was uh the, the the hard part for me was first of all if I didn't talk a lot, that's not really my thing is to rip into people and tell them crush their dreams. They're here to do one minute of stand up. It's kind of it's a definitely funny process. Kill Tony, Brian, his buddy get out there. There's a band behind him if you don't know and then the most of Austin comes up to uh try to get on stage. It's literally most of the town and they all have a minute to do their shit and then we and then Tony interviews them and then we chirp in with our bullshit but uh, they know what they're doing. It's a very smooth running operation. And, what, uh, let me ask you guys, because yeah. I've only seen it once, and there was this Robin Williamsy young guy who was mm-hmm. actually kind of great. Uh, oh, this is cool. What is the the core reason it's so successful besides the reality show aspect? Because I saw one where two guys went at each other, like really trying to dominate each other, two comedians, and it was like sort of a turf war. So is that 
part of the magic of it. It's fun to see people truly angry and kind of humiliated sometimes and also get laughs. It's a train wreck. And I think everybody loves to watch a, you know, um, uh, I think everybody loves to watch the drama of it. And uh, I think Dave is right. I mean, like it is the biggest thing. I mean, like you can't even like, you know, uh, God help you if you need an operation that night, because I don't think you're going to be able to get one. I mean, everybody's there. The The ambulance drivers are all there trying to get on. (laughs) Everybody. It's like the town shuts down. Like oh, I see. everybody, it's, it's kill Tony night. That's what we do. Yeah. So what happened is I sat there and Attell is uh, perfect for the situation because he just can say anything funny about anything. And kill Tony runs the show. So I sit there as a class act and wait for my time to jump in. I wait till I've got a little bit of a joke. But I was happy with that. I thought it was fun. I wasn't super comfortable because I had a fucking f5 tornado in front of me blowing a fan in my face i don't know why there was a arc why do they form. always put you near air conditioning i don't on, know and i'm planes. such a pussy <laughs> it's unbelievable is, is the word not gotten out yet i'm like <sighs> so i put on my shades honestly because it was so blowing so hard in my face so this is a new move put your shades on then i put my hat on then i put my coat on and atel was starting to get worried like what's next so then we watch but he smokes and and tony smokes which smoking yeah. doesn't really bother me as much because I grew up, my mom smoked and every girl I knew smoked. And so I don't care. Uh, it was really the coldness. And then uh, it, I thought it was fun. Like people would do a minute. I think that's part of the appeal, Dana. They do a minute and it's either fucking dead silence. And uh, one guy said, how long have you been doing comedy? And he goes, 13 years. I go, mm, I would have taken the under on that because he, he fucking, I thought it was one day. And uh, I'm like, oh, so, you know, that's that's the only meanness I can do to them. Everyone thinks I'm a real mean. Does, does everybody pad the audience? It seems like you get your college buddies drunk and then you go do your minute, right? Is there a lot of that yeah. going on? I would. None of these people have friends. They're all low. <laughs> and they Insult. it was emotionally cold in there. It was really there was no love in the room. And oh. I think he was the ringmaster. He enjoys this kind of like pulling the strings and he gets into their like real lives and everything like that. And I think we're of a different generation where it's like, you're supposed to be supportive to the new comics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, Hey, you know what? It's a process. You keep doing it. You're going to get better. But Tony, of course, tough love. No, none of that. He goes yeah. right. Out. And, uh, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, people get it, you know, like uh, <laughs> this is kind of like, uh, you know, it's kind of like reverse support, you know, in a way. Really <laughs> Definitely. Want. <laughs> Definitely yeah. something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, did you the, ever, it was pretty fun yeah. though. Did you ever do anything like that? In San Francisco, there was a stand up comedy competition, but you went oh, yeah, through rounds. That one was at a least. big deal. I was in it in college in 77. <laughs> did you have off. any of that out where you were starting? There was always these weird, you know, like, um, uh, I guess it was always sponsored by somebody, you know, something like that, mm-hmm. where it's like, uh, you know, but I don't think it was anything like that scene. And I always, you know, since, this is really kind of our, like our first real meeting is that I always wanted to ask you about like that San Francisco back in the day, because, you know, I knew Slate and I knew mm-hmm. um, a lot of the big names that came out of San Francisco and, and like mm-hmm. how important it was to like comedy and especially stand up. And then it kind of like, you know, by the time I got there, you know, it was already like, I, I guess it wasn't as um, as wild as it was back then, but really like, you know, I always heard all the stories about Robin coming down and mm-hmm. even to, um, you know, uh, the punchline, the original punchline and then Cobbs, you know, that's really the scene I knew, but you knew like the purple onion. What, what was the onion place? Ooh, onion, a little tiny room. Yeah, in- what was it called though? The purple onion or something? Yeah, the purple onion. Yeah. yeah okay, cool. Yeah. I never played there. And Cobbs moved. Did you ever play Cobbs before it moved? Yes, it I moved. did. There was it a moved. fire, a mysterious fire. Yeah. And then they had- yeah right uh that was larry bubbles brown i think was the arson on that one <laughs> no, he's, yeah he's another there. unsung hero of comedy larry bubbles who every time i play cops i make sure he's on the show because i love him he's great he's one of my best friends he's he's an amazing human and extraordinarily funny but such a he, he makes comedians funnier because he legitimately will if you say something he thinks is funny he'll laugh at it and then repeat it and keep laughing and it's mm-hmm. really sincere because we used to have this running gig. We would show up, you know, you drive to the gig 
and it's like a little theater and the, the guy goes, hey, are you with the show? And it's like, we are the fucking show, motherfucker. <laughs> and I said, you jack him up against the wall, say, listen, squirt. So to Larry Bubbles Brown, listen, squirt was the funniest <laughs> thing. And he kept <laughs> squirt and it went <laughs> go for 10 years. But yeah, it was uh, Slayton was amazing, really hard to follow. Uh, Michael Pritchard, Robin was always around blowing the roof off. You're about to uh, go on at the little club and Robin's going to do a set. It'd be like three hours. Yeah, it was quite a quite a scene. I don't know if Boston was sort of a, we had Bob the Cat East Coast too. version. Bobcat came through and then Paula Poundstone from Boston and they blew up in San Francisco. Yeah. yeah, San Francisco was definitely the place where people, I think, figured it out. And uh, uh, credit to you, Dana. It, I think you're one of the few guys that Larry Bubbles will get on a plane for. The guy hates to fly. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at him. He kind of <laughs> looks like a, a dust bowl guy, you know, like back of a <laughs> back of a, a jalopy, you know, with his like piano or something tied up there. He's, he's not a flyer. So he's like oh, somebody. Yeah. It took one day to know him and twenty years to believe it. But yeah, I'm guy, not yeah. a great flyer, but I've never walked a flight. You know, there's times it's been thunderstorms and all that. I don't enjoy it. But so I'm meeting Larry, San Francisco, SFO, and he's there. And you're gonna, we're about to board. And Larry goes, I think I I think I got to walk the flight. So immediately that's I was cool. like, that's that OK. We'll do it next time. I wasn't going to shit on. We'll do it next time. You just you know, it doesn't matter. We're playing Vegas. And then I said, well, you know, maybe you, if you wanted, he doesn't drink at all, he drinks Diet Coke, but he had, I guess, one drink and he got on the plane and then he's like, you know, he never, he's not, he doesn't, he, I don't know he ever drank after that, but it's like, this is great. This is the way you do oh. it, you know? So wow. that helped him for that flight. But Larry makes up for it with his incredible knowledge of everyone's birthday. He can tell you the day of your mm -hmm. birthday, which is like that a- that looks good on the resume. Annabelle I don't know if that impresses the ladies, but that's <laughs> like, hey, what's your birthday? And then I'll say that was a Wednesday, or he'll know. So. And his classic line, I went to the doctor, and I said, what's that lump on my testicle? He said, that is your testicle, you idiot, or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> that's his dick. And then he does a Wah. No, but you can yeah. say to him, Tuesday, mm. 1968, or yeah. yeah. Uh, no, March 31st, 1968. It was a Tuesday, and I was like, what? <laughs> and you look it up. But yeah, he's great. He's a one of a kind. Yeah. So I, I'm just curious. I don't know. Yes. I, um, I'm always curious. curious when about? did you know? When, when did, let's put it this way. <laughs> when did people not want to follow you? Yeah. Me? Let's, let's just put it that way. When, yeah, like, I don't want any way. part of that fucking middle act. You know, when was it like you you have to close? How many, um, how many years you know, to in? Be honest, like the New York scene, it was very, um, you know, back in the 90s, I guess. You know, it was really, um, there was a lot of really hardcore acts here at that point. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't put it against Boston because I think Boston was definitely like another level of like, wow, these guys can blow blow it, you know, blow it out. But I I was a late night comic. That's where they put me. And I kind of like embraced it instead of like going like, you know, I'm going to move up or anything like that. I felt like at the end of the show, like it was harder, but it was also freer at, to some degree where like, you know, if you oh, yeah. can get anything out of them, it was really like um, it was really it was kind of like the pond had already been fished out. Mm -hmm. But whatever you thought was like a huge whale, you know, so I was like, this is really good for me. But that was really them like putting me there, you know, and then I kind of like got better at it and better at it. And then when I would move up in the show, and it really has helped me on the road too, which is like, you know, following people and all that kind of stuff. I, I, I felt like I was stronger. I was a stronger act. And, you know, usually that means just more bad habits, you know, like, you know, I knew what to do and how to, how to work the crowd and everything. But in terms of like, um, you know, I would say sometime in the nineties, you know, when I became a headliner, I, I actually really, you know, since this is an SNL kind of thing yeah. here, um, I'm kind of like what you would you would call the um, the uh, you know the guy who uh, didn't really you know I know SNL is an experience <laughs> different for everybody but for me it was kind of like something I did when I really wanted to do stand up and like uh, you know agents and managers said this would be great and like you know I auditioned and more liked me and I was a writer I wasn't a performer and you know I really wanted to learn how to do it but I didn't really 
have that mindset yet. I really wanted to be a stand-up. You know, I wanted to be Bill Hicks or Sam Kinison. But that's where I met Dave, yeah. who was really kind to me the whole way through. And I was also a fan of his before I had, uh, oh. you know, been a part of I really liked his stand-up. Great stand-up. I liked the way he did things. And, uh, you know, to be honest, I was like, you know, it, it, it it told me more about show business than it did about comedy because I saw how things work there in terms of like, you know, there's a host. And then if you get something on, you get to sit closer to Lauren at the party. And then, <laughs> this person, you know, there's like this kind of like yeah. levels and circles of like mm -hmm, influence yeah. there. But I got to meet Mike Myers and, you know, the late great Phil Hartman and, you know, Sandler, who uh, always another guy, very cool to me. You know, I got to meet a lot of people who I, uh, you know, have gone on to great success. And I was glad to like, know them but it was never my thing but i think for you guys that's really like where you know like things gel like where you got to take all the stuff that you would learn yeah. you know like uh and put it in an ensemble you know uh, i guess format which you know i'm i'm impressed by that to this day i really impressed how people can take stuff and turn it into something a sketch or a movie or something like that so well I, I, i'm a club comic you know in a reverse way that it like i was uh my stand-up was pretty goofy. It is now. When I, I look at jokesmiths or brilliant writing and people yeah. who can really take a topic like you do in this latest special, Hot Cross Buns, okay. um, it's like a magic trick to me. Like, okay, there's the introduction and then you're turning it. And it's like, oh, wow, that's the best turn. That's the best payoff to that setup. And you're doing it over and over again. And for me, I was up there doing Chopping Broccoli and Voices. I'm, I'm just doing trying to do sketches. In, yeah. in clubs with hecklers and blenders. So when I finally got to do sketch, it was really, okay, that fit me. But um, you and um, that Dave, David, are just well, great, at, great writers of, of material, just real material. Well, um, I can't tell you how many, how many especially uh, girls I know who would always bring up that chopping up the broccoli thing to me. They'd be like, how do you broccoli. got a joke like that? I'm like, I don't got anything. I like agree. That. You know, I this, think it's ridiculous. I can do that. <laughs> Someone's got I mean, a joke. No one's like, got a joke like you really, that. You really, you really like hit a nerve with these women. They love that bit. So, <laughs> you know, don't throw it out. <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> since there is no joke other than a guy who's horrible and is utterly uh, committed to how bad he is. But um, that's on Dana's well, you know, album called. You're uh, being humble now because you, you know, you are kind of in the. Um, I guess you could say the Mount Olympus of comedy. I mean, like, you know, you. people didn't really Mount I, I Olympus. Too busy being successful to actually like do the kind of road that we do now, you know, like road mm -hmm. is like a really, uh, it's never been better for everybody. I mean, like yeah. at amphitheaters and these things. I mean, it used to be like in the seventies, eighties, like you saw, you know, like Martin or dice or somebody mm -hmm. like that doing that, but not everybody could do it. Now there's like at least 20, 30 people who are selling out these mega, you yeah. know, venues so you know that's not my thing but i think it's really good for comedy you know yeah, i comedy's I love, a big deal i love where you shot the special and the way it felt at Cobb's, the way it was lit and the tightness of the audience and stuff i thought it really popped specials can sometimes lay there i've been in a few myself and they don't quite happen i i think you were kind of saying you guys are really great tonight i don't know if you were just celebrating the moment but it seemed like that taping of you and doing that set was a 10 from what I could gather, which like is a rarity really, really connected, but or was well, it just, did you feel extra good? Cause they don't always go that well, right? The taping. Yeah, that's yeah no, that's true. Cause uh, you know, the first show we had a lot of technical problems and the director of the, of the special uh, Scott Gall Gallick, he, he's a really good friend of mine. He's done my road work one. And like, I met him doing the, you know, he was the director of the porn awards, the ABN awards, you know, so I've known him for decades oh. now. And like the one thing that you can't ever pay someone to do is be passionate. And this guy's so passionate. Like we do, we edited it for so long. Like we were just trying to put all of these different things that I had done together in like a cohesive thing. And the crowd, of course, was better than me. My crowd's really good. I'm not just saying that. Mm -hmm. Every comic I bring on the road, they're like, wow, your, com your crowd gets it. They are really good. They're older. They're like couples who are like you know basically like this is our night out aficionados they like yeah, they know what they like young judgmental group that you see kind of today now like dripping into these clubs and they really kind of like understand sarcasm and like it's a joke and it's not like a pre i'm not preaching or anything like that so they're up for anything and the crowd that you saw mm -hmm. there tonight especially the second crowd was it blew me away because i'm in my head like we all know for specials like i got to do this and then this and i don't yeah. want to 
mess it up like I did on the first show. Meanwhile, I should have just rolled with them the whole way through. It would have been a whole different special, but still like, you're right. The energy was like, I was very lucky that night. You know, I was really and lucky. I did like that a little. I don't, I don't remember if I've seen it before, but there was a camera on the side of the stage. You don't see. And yes. then you would kind of look to it like you were like, it was a friend or something. Uh, a person, mm -hmm. you know, and I thought well, that was kind of nice. This nose. I mean, look at it. <laughs> I really, really didn't capture my best side there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I love that. I, I, I am used to like, you know, the cat, whatever it is, I'm trying to work it into the show. I think we all agree. Like those are the most memorable moments. Like Dave's really good at that. Too. Like I've seen him like, you know, something happens in the room where there's somebody in the room and he'll like, you know, like be able to like, like tailor a joke to them or like use it as part of a riff or something like that. I love that stuff. I think that's what makes stand up better than, you know, pretty much yeah. juggling. I mean, you never see that in juggling, mm -hmm. you know? Well, you know, Dana, yeah. what, what I do that's interesting. If I yes. Let's talk about, and what is <laughs> yeah. the name of Dana? Hot Cross Buns is a good name because you know, here's it. Dana's name is uh, Blenders and Hecklers. That's a good name, actually. That's hecklers you're, and that's Blenders. You're like that. yeah. That's what you're thinking for your name of your special. That's what I'm thinking for the next Dana one. Mine? Oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Hecklers Blenders and Blenders, Hecklers. because you said when I was doing it, I was just when doing was all heck, starting, Hecklers and starting Blenders. Starting out. Yeah, uh, Blenders and Hecklers is better, yeah. I like that. The other thing that I loved about respect, I'll just say it, the 35-minute thing or 37 minutes, it's like yeah. I think that we've adapted to sending people stuff. And just this short attention span thing, it felt like the perfect length to me. I'm not just saying it's like, that was just great. Right. I don't because then there's no low. Everyone knows if you do an hour, you can only yeah. kind of go to 40 and then they're too tired or whatever. And you got to fight through the Get trench. Your closer. And then you got to peak again. Um, so 35 is just like bam, 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 you know, playing the recorder, boom. And it was like, ah. So well, did you have to fight for that? I mean, yeah. No, I mean, like, I think I think the cool thing about Netflix is that. They'll let it be any length at this point. Like the idea, like you said, is like, it's all about attention span, but it has to be 40 minutes. And I told this to David that it has yeah. to be 40 minutes to get in their algorithm to get into like their different kind of like, I guess, oh, um, no. placements. so 40 minutes is what it had to be. We had it at 35 <laughs> and a half or something. And then they told us it's the week of. And once again, Scott, my director said, whoa, we're going to do it. So we put more stuff in. And uh, actually, the last thing we put in, which is me playing the recorder, yeah. Seals, which we thought was a throwaway, became the talk of the special. So, like, how often does that happen? Like, it was yeah. like, wow, you know, like, whatever. I, I really lucked out on that one. But, yeah, I would say 40 minutes for me personally as a viewer and fan of comedy. Like, I just watched, you know, I've watched a lot of my friend's specials. Like, I just watched Jimmy Carr's special. Really, really cool. He's a very funny guy. Awesome. Like, with a line. I mean, the guy can get hysterical. Yeah, his is, a, his is the classic hour. And like mm -hmm. it works for him. You know, it's a it's a great show for me. My jokes are so small, like three a minute. Like that's usually what it is. Two to three mm -hmm. a minute. It's like I'm I'm like on fumes by like 30. I'm really like, oh, OK, uh, you know, <laughs> I'd like, rather yeah. go shorter, too. I think Theo's was a little was maybe 45, 50. I, I envy that. I would say the same thing. You don't need it because also then it's going to go out. Then it's going to get chopped up. And then everyone wants to see different bits and no one remembers the whole hour. No one remembers. They, they, there's a handful they repeat. You don't know which ones. And then an hour is so long. And I'm sure the algorithm says people last about 20. I, you, you feel like you want to front load your best shit now because not everyone's waiting for that big closer. I think 16 is average. Last time I checked. Yes. Oh, oh wow. is that it? That's yeah. Tough. Best compliment I got, and I'm not really a web guy, but we had to track it for the whole special, is uh, one guy said, I watched it to the end, and I'm going to watch it again. Usually people watch 15 minutes, and they immediately start judging. Like, hey, this sucked, or whatever. Yeah, right. I trying to do, you know? But like, <laughs> all the way to the end, that's a rarity, you know? Okay, I got another name for your special, Dana. Algo Nation. <laughs> I was going to call it the other Oppenheimer. No? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call yours White Sweater Man, David. Like this that. isn't a sweater, but it's nice. Oh, it's, okay. a, it's a golf pullover, but I appreciate it. It was going to come off earlier, and we had June gloom uh, in April. Hmm. But it's all gloomy, and then it's supposed to burn off. Sorry if I lose you with this uh, weather <laughs> lingo, Dave. But uh, 
it burns off because in, in LA we have May gray, stay close. Then yeah. we have June, June gloom. gloom. Yes. Then what you don't know is July fry. And what Dana doesn't know is Fogest. <laughs> Fogest. So Covers in everything. Yeah. In Southern California, maybe it's Fuck, maybe yeah. at the beach. Yeah. I think it just rhymes. Okay, give me September. No, uh, well, I'm not there yet. September rain? No. Yeah. I thought it was that Simon and Garfunkel tune, but you know, <laughs> every podcast can handle the weather. Usually people are like, you know, they're gonna watch it later. You guys, I like how you dig in. You really believe. They're going to watch this weather. <laughs> the main thing about nice podcasting, out. which you both know, is that everyone uh, uh, that's consuming this entertainment right now is doing mm -hmm. something else actively. Yeah. They are gardening. They are walking yes. somewhere. They're at the gym. So it's lo-fi. And they're driving predominantly. They're driving. So they're not even... They space out. And, you know, so, but yeah. they, they, they I, say they want to hear us legitimately talking. So part of it being not always funny and just being real or kind of boring is actually good. Dave, do you remember, So, was Sarah Silverman at your SNL when you were there? Yeah, it was me, Sarah, and uh, Jay Moore were the new people. And then there was okay. a couple of other ones too. I don't know, I didn't, I, I really, I should have learned all the cast, but no, um, <laughs> that was great. And um, at uh, Norm's Memorial, who you were very, mm. Funny and let's oh. face it, Kevin Neal and crush that. He was so, <laughs> that guy is like gifted. He's such a gifted guy. Yeah, he's brilliant. But someone has to do a bit about comedians going to funerals, and it, 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 no one so... talks about the guy. It's always well, about who crushed. He's that good. But Neil, it's and always who who got like. No matter how sad you are, did he kill? Did ne he kill? But Neilan yeah. always kills in that kind of. He's got that his style. He's a great his... comic too. He's another guy I was a fan of before I met yeah. him. And the um the what you call it uh. At Norm's funeral, who Norm was the uh, the new guy that year too, you know, and he went on to great success there. And he he um, you know was really cool to me. Like I you know brought him out to the clubs when you know before he got so busy and everything. But for me, uh, Jay and I we shared a room. You know, we shared uh, uh, an office then, and like um, we were both kind of like you know for Jay especially like who I thought had all the skills that like he could do characters, he could do voices, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. He was a good looking guy, you know, he's a good looking guy and everything like that. Very funny. You know, I, I saw the, you know, like how hard yeah. it is the new guy there. For me, I kind of already accepted my fate, but for him, like I was like, you know, <laughs> yeah, I can't, you know, like you, you've got you a know, future get on something, you know, but I guess Farley was like another one that like I got to, you know, meet him, the late great. And like, uh, no one ever liked him, you know, like uh, to no. this day, I've never met no. anybody that kind of comedic, power you know do you know what i'm saying like that, that like inner like like a battery like i just say inner like just like constantly funny so um you know yeah. there was definitely a lot of great experiences and the most of the names we just talked about went on to great success you know sarah and of course uh norm you know still one of the best comics i, I think his comedy is underrated you know and uh jim downey who we was talking to at the thing another guy like amazing guy we were talking about like just how like you know just norm like the master of timing you know i mean like his comedy was that good so well, as far as master his, of his too peers, much timing as far as his peers there's no way he's underrated i don't know if the public at large but yeah that's what i mean like yeah, yeah. Like we you know we all know like yeah the norm was also a singularity like farley god mm -hmm. rest her soul but norm's uh timing was so unique the way he would jump yeah, the problem with OJ is like he kills people. You know, I don't know. It's just <laughs> kind of you know. Besides the killing part, he's a great guy. Anyway, Norman's also just well, Dave amazing. at the funeral, which uh, whatever it was, it was a funeral memorial, whatever. But you know, with all these stand-ups there, people will speak in quotes, and it's really going to be a mixture of sad and. J there's no way no one's not doing jokes, even though it's horrible. The hard part for me was going up and you're getting a little misty and here comes a dolly shot. I was like, are we filming this? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. You're rarely speaking from your heart and they're like, can we go again? Oh, wow. So, yeah, so it, it was, you remember that it was filmed and then we stayed yeah. after and. And Conan was great on that too. Conan was always. Oh yeah. Conan was fucking funny. Yeah, I, I, I fell on the way to the stage and then I yes. told the guy on the side, I go, Hey, this step right here is higher than the steps. And I wiped down. He goes, he's a crew guy. He goes, oh yeah, it's always been like that. And everybody fucking falls. I go, well, 
maybe look into that. I don't know. You know, you're going to get sued every single day of your life. So I fell, of course. And then afterwards, well, is that the one we stayed after? And then we. Can I stop you for a second? I yeah, please. Homage to Dick Van Dyke. That's what I saw. I saw a guy do a classic Van Dyke. On yes, the way you saw it right. But I think <laughs> the I classic <laughs> ACL tear. I think that's what I'm talking about. I do I because I, I separated this shoulder doing the Dick Van Dyke stunt uh, at SNL playing Dan Quayle in a, in a, on, on Friday to pre-tape on a little uh, tiny carpet with no stunt quarter. Grade three separated shoulder. Still, still hurts. Any wow. Still hurts. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get into it. What's the healthcare like? I never stayed long enough to get on their program. Is it good? Oh, it's good. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. good. So, do you? Okay. Do you Lauren you, goes. You're fine. So yeah. you're okay. You're a stand up coming up and stuff. And then, uh, from what I read, you got on Letterman first, and then yes, they showed that to Lauren or Lauren saw it. So, what was Letterman we, like to go on live with Jay and Sarah at a club? I think we're standing in New York. And then everybody became a performer and I became a writer. And back then it was like, if you're ugly, you're a writer. So I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm ugly. And then they threw me into the, into the writer thing. And I'm up against these Harvard guys. And I was like, these guys really like, they're almost like, um, almost like, I, I guess, like built Robocop, you know, yeah. like they're really, they're really good at it. And like Dave Mandel. And there was a couple other guys who were like, just like, wow, it kind of blew you away how young and good they were at this. And, uh, you know, to be honest, like when you're used to writing for your own voice and then you write something for somebody else and it's good, giving that up, man, it's really it's tough. Hard. It's hard, isn't it hard? A couple of times where I'm like, I got nothing, but I'm going to use it for my, uh, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> oh, so you're I gonna... guess that is the job, you know? Did you, did you, that they, did you get on update at all? Like, oh, uh, you did, didn't you? No, do no, no, no. I, you didn't get a I, I don't think it was even, I don't think it was as loose as it is now where like if you, feel like you got something good you could try it but you know i i really like um to be honest like my writing experience there was what it was and um uh the guys who really like i kind of think got me he were like john stewart i wrote on both of his shows uh before the daily show and i was a character on the daily show so to this mm -hmm. day i'd say john was really the guy who got me and uh, it was great being a part of that show but you know at the end of the day i think um you know you guys probably know it ebbs and flows over there. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, like a, like a, like an animal it has to keep moving, you know, and uh, the people that are parts of it, like they have years that are stronger than others, but you know, the two people, the other two people on this podcast, they're definitely made this, this uh, thing that kids grew up watching and they uh, all want to be a part of it. I mean, like to this day, like there's kids out there right now, that's their goal. And uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, I know this is something you say at the end of the podcast, and we're probably not there yet, but I was like, <laughs> no, no, it's over. Like, it, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> hey, to, 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 like, to finish the thought, it was just like, you know, um, uh, there, was a, there was a point there where I was really depressed, and I was like, you know, um, I guess it's, it's, it's not for me, but like uh, Bill Hicks died. I think that was like a big deal. Like he died and I was kind of the only guy there who seemed to be really upset about it. And I was like, what? I mean, this guy, Bill, and like nobody really kind of got it, you know? And I was like, well, I'm not really like connected. Like I'm not connected to them like I am to like the comedy world. So Stand I kind of knew there. after that, that was like, that's what it did, is. So uh, just a little insert there. So did you, I don't know. Did you ever play Spellbinders? I think it was in Houston. <laughs> anyway. Probably, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I w just went down there a couple of times, early 80s, way before SNL. And, it, and then my opener was Bill Hicks. It's just like, wow. He was really young and he had a big sport coat. He come out and he, he obviously was great immediately. <laughs> it's like, damn, this is my opener. But like 10 minutes yeah. in, he would take a beer out of his jacket. He would put a cold beer. <laughs> it's like, I go, it's yeah. a long way to go. Um, <laughs> the whole but time. We, our game was, I go, I'm going to do the dice in the cockpit joke. So I was just as my opener. He, he loved that I was trying to intentionally alienate the audience. I came here on Mexicana Airlines and the, uh, the pilot had dice in the cockpit. Ah, you know. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. did you know Bill or work with him? Met him twice, three times. And like, he gave me a great compliment one time. He gave me a tag on a joke. And I was like smiling for like two days after that. But uh, I didn't know him probably the way you did. But I will say one thing is that like, you know, a lot of people consider him like the grandfather of alt comedy or woke comedy. But the fact your story says it right there. He was playing a club, a dive club in Houston. 
Yeah. And like the guy could hold his own against anyone. He played through the South. He played through everywhere, anywhere you could go. And he did this all like when he was like 17, 18, 19, 20 yeah. years old. And then he was like, you know what? There's more to this. And that opened his world. And like, uh, you know, he he became a deep thinker and he's always was like a well-read dude. And so like talented. I mean, like I remember one time we were at the original improv in New York and he was hanging out with some of us afterwards. And he's like, hey, is that a guitar? And he immediately picked it up. And it was like Stevie Ray Vaughan came in the room. Like, it was that good, you know? But like the guy was always like searching and like trying to push it. And like when you see him on Letterman, I think you're not really getting the whole like feel of Bill Hicks. I mean, you got to see him live. And, you know, to this day, his last play at Caroline's, I didn't go that night. I really wish I did. But that was right before he basically said, I'm too sick to perform and I'm going back home and I'm going to have to do that. And, you know, that was kind of the end of it. So I kind of I missed out on like, a, you know, something that would never, ever happen you know, like it was like, whatever it was, it was dumb of me not to go that night. So anyway, but how cool was it was when, when it was open for you? Like, well, he wasn't Bill Hicks, Bill Hicks then, you know? Yeah. He was, he was just, uh, hey, I mean, did he change his name? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Did you, Dana, could you tell he had something there? Yes. And I liked him immediately. I, I could tell he was incredibly bright and, uh, but we were just playing this little goofy club and and um he had something right 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 off the bat and then i saw one i guess he had a special or something i saw him a few years later and yeah he took it to this whole other idea uh mort Saul meets uh sam canis i don't know he he went yeah. very stepped outside the lines of, of a stand up but remained really funny which is sort of the hat trick you know when you were when you were doing comedy like in the um in the eighties, especially, how much influence was like the show Seinfeld on you? Because it seems like everybody was like, you do this till you get the sitcom and then you never have yeah. to do it again. Right. I'm sure that came at you guys that way the whole time. I, w- I was in that uh, chasing the sitcom dream at the improv where Tim Allen got picked up and then Roseanne and it was both of those were huge shows, yeah. Ro- home improvement. Yeah. And they're basically looking, they were in the audience a lot because it wasn't about killing, which I didn't get. It was just what persona can we write a show around? And I didn't get that at all. I was sweaty trying to fucking get laughs, but you were always, I always thought you were so, uh, I just always like started. I I really dug what you were doing. All right. I remember at the Tempe improv, Mm -hmm. I think you one night I walked in at the end, Dan Muir, who we both know, Mm -hmm. um, like he's like, Hey, he's playing over there. You want to come to, I'm like, yeah, I want to check it out. And we watched him from the balcony and it was just like, so funny just the way you were (laughs) You know, like you, you basically had them. So, you know, you got to playing with them a bit. So I love well, that. You know? David and, uh, doesn't. And I've been guilty this many times of pushing and David never seems to push. And so it's very calm to watch just his brain working. You know, it's not like he's I, dancing yeah, for his you. dollar. There's money. I get I get the complaints I get sometimes in the road are like, it didn't look like you were even trying. I'm like, this is <laughs> all the a fucking part. the whole idea. Like <laughs> it's all thought out and you just go. You're just like, and I go, I still talk for a straight fucking hour. <laughs> like, it's hard to do, like, have a setup punch and have this all weave into each other. But if it looks casual, that's a good idea. You don't need yada, da, 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 da. You know, also, I was going to tell you, I didn't, um, uh, Bill Hicks and Mitch Hedberg, I Mitch didn't really Hedberg, appreciate yeah. or get to know after or get to know their work until it was too late. So I was never really, I remember they heard said Bill Hicks might have been on Conan when I was at SNL. I don't even know if I knew who he was. I just heard that and said, oh, that guy I'd heard of a little bit. But yeah. later on, and even now you see on TikTok or Instagram, you can see clips. And that's kind of nice because there's so many things I just didn't know, uh, especially Mitch Hedberg. I see on there a lot. But these guys are great guys that just floated around and then it's just too early. Too, well, too Mitch, especially, I mean, this is like uh, something I do know is that People always say, all these young comics, they sound like you, like me. That's, that's what they're saying. And I go, if you want to know the one guy who's been jacked the most, it's Mitch Edwards. <laughs> There's so many generations of comics who now like, have like grown up, I guess, watching him. And less, just his voice, his cadence, and his style. Like, I mean, I've seen it a million different ways. And I used to, like in the beginning, be really angry. Like, that's Hedberg. You're doing Hedberg up there. You know, like, that's what the guy's doing. And that, now I get it. It's just like, they don't really get that it's Hedberg anymore. They just like yeah. know that it's funny. I think, you know, I, I don't know. I'm trying to be generous to them, but I mean, that's really one of those things where it's like, 
Hedberg had a big impact on um, on the generation of comedy. You know, he, so. you know, I'm just putting this together a little bit. Theo Vaughn and Hedberg, just not not that he's ripping them off, but both have a quirky. Well, Mitch did have this quirky timing, and I don't know was he from the south or any kind of accent, but he just had a really weird way of speaking. And he was from many um, Wisconsin, I guess, mm -hmm. Minneapolis, and uh, he moved south. And um, his joke was like he was driving and he had something wrong with the front end alignment and he ended up there like he was trying to get to Texas and the car kept veering left. He was and pulling was, to the right. Oh, I see. Yeah, something like that. So that's how he got there. And like he worked in kitchens. He was just basically kind of like a kind of like a stoner kitchen guy. And that's where he started doing comedy. But he definitely had that kind of like southern, like, you know, that kind of yeah. charm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Theo also is like, you know, because I always th feel of him as like Cajun, you know, like he has that cool, like there's just something cool. there. Yeah, you know. it's, it's cool. By the way, I just want to, you you know that you're kind of a touchstone for stand up, right? Like a tell, mm -hmm. a tell. It's constant. For me, coming back from SNL and playing some clubs or playing with Larry, other people, uh, it you're constantly mentioned. And referred to, I you you know that right? I I just want to, I because I always assume that everybody. There, yeah. It's hard I mean, to know how people there. perceive you, but I'm just saying mm -hmm. anecdotally, just oh yeah, but Atel was there, and Atel, it just I don't know, it it's just I I hope it's nice it's, to hear. It's a good <laughs> rep to have out there. Yeah. Uh, you, be less excited about my success. No, it just kind of angers me quietly. But I just <laughs> I thought this wasn't going to be all about you, and it's sort of turning that way. I mean, we can talk about the weather again. I mean, oh my God, did you, there's some monsoonal moisture I didn't mention earlier. <laughs> David's a great, great stand up. Now, back to uh, the goat. Yeah. yeah Listen, no. um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, mixed it up. I was also of that generation of like a lot of them passed too quickly. Edberg, Geraldo, yeah. Greg Geraldo, who's another oh, yeah. great line guy, um, Patrice. So I was of that kind of group, you know, like of that, of that, um, the, uh, you know, that, that time in comedy. But I would say that, um, the reason why people talk about me is because I'm out there, you know, like I really, you know, have been doing the club so long now. I mean, honestly, I don't even know like what the exit strategy is anymore. It's like, <laughs> part of the, I, part I don't of think the, you have to have it. Dan ups a good and, biz and to, to be your, in. To your point, is, you're like, really good, yeah. you'll see someone and we're going to talk about in, insomniac in a second, but you'll see someone at, at different times throughout their career. So then the latest thing, I don't pay attention to everyone all the time was this special. And I go, Oh, maybe that's his best special. Or certainly yeah. haven't lost a step or anything. So you, why would you ever stop? You know, I mean, I don't think there's been well, any slippage. <laughs> I don't know. Do you do you ever feel? I mean, this is like a good crew to ask. Is like when I was first starting out, I felt like my my writing and my performing were low. And then like as I would keep going, like the writing would get better, but the performing still sucked. Then the performing for a year was better than the writing. And then it became this. And so now I feel like they're both kind of equal. Like I kind of know what I'm doing and I can yeah. write a joke and, you know, I'm able to like turn whatever I want into a joke eventually. I mean, like we all know we fight that battle every day, but, you know, I'm like, this is a good spot to be in. I'm glad like, you know, I'm able to do it and the crowd's still getting it. But like, am I relevant? Am I any of the things that are important in today's comedy world? No. So I'm also going like, you know, Hey, I'm not doing it for everybody. I'm doing it for my crowd and I'm doing it for, you know, what I want to do. But at the end of the day, you got to entertain, right? So like, mm. at what point are you just kind of like, here comes that old hack, you know, like. No, well, you see my, that all was your me topic, saying that. What is relevant <clears throat> today? Like, is it the topics, the style? I mean, seem like. You I don't were, know. You tell me. I, I, mean, I, yeah. I don't know. It seems like your, your topics were all of today. Well, um, that was also a post pandemic special, which. The one, the two things that Netflix asked me, and I asked them questions because I go, is name of special important? That's why, like, it was funny that you guys were bringing up these names. And they're yeah. like, you know, because I don't want to call it hot cross buns. I want to call it, you know, <laughs> I want to call it something else. And they said, yeah. oh, that's not that good. And then um, they said, don't, don't, what I go, what turns people off? You have all this data now. And they said, yeah. COVID jokes and political jokes. People don't want to hear any of that. So I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm sad. I don't have any of that stuff. And then I realized I got like, a COVID joke, <sighs> political joke in the first five minutes, even other well hidden jokes. Yeah. Well, I like that, your little turn on a uh, little political thing, and you go, "I'm, I'm a, I'm a Biden, Biden. guy, Hunter, yeah, Hunter Biden." You know, but it's the yeah. way you jump. Yeah. One of my reps' favorite jokes. He's always telling me about love it. it. <laughs> like, yeah, no, that's a good one. You know, but then it was like, 
That's a political joke. What do we do? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, we shut it down. It. We kept it in. Yeah. So, you know. Algo killer. Algo killer. Yeah. So, you know, but <laughs> relevant in terms of like, you know, am I going to preach to the people? I was never that guy. I was really kind of a, you know, a line guy, uh, a joke guy. Yeah. I'm like, uh, it's all about the jokes for me. Well, you, Dave. Like, I think it's I, the same I, thing where it's like, even though you think it's a throwaway joke. Some people like give it a life all its own. And you're like, sure. you're taking it too far. It's not that, you know? Well, Dana, you know, we, he was just saying a good point when we started, it was like sitcom and all that. There's a point, Nate Bergazzi, Theo right now, where you could start as a standup and it's actually less money to go into movies and TV. So <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. they're making so much or they're just on the road that you don't yes. have to do anything other than be a standup. And, and, and you just keep working and Dave's been doing it a while and he keeps making money and if it keeps working and he's got a crowd, he's got a good rep and that works. I mean, it's hard to keep it going for a while, but mm -hmm. these guys do great. So you, you could say, I don't want to stop and do a sitcom. It's I'm going to lose money or I'm going to, that's so weird because it's less of that in the world and less comedy movies out there in the world and more stand up gets bigger stand -up and bigger. It's so. amazing. Both Nate. Bergazzi and Bert Kreisner kind of intimated yeah. to us that they felt like we were really in show business because they hadn't had a movie or a TV show. We're like, wait a minute, you're you're the master of your own fate yeah, and you're matter. making more than a sitcom star. Um, well, you picked up two great names because Nate and Bert, both ends of the spectrum, super funny guys. And both of them went through that process of developing all that kind of stuff. At the end of the day, they're doing exactly what they should do. Their crowd loves it. Mm -hmm. And they're also really good dudes. They're great to the other comics. Oh, they yeah. are fans, right? So they're doing everything right. But they also went through that endless loop of um, development. And I think it would be great, like, cleansing. If, like, everybody, um, all the pitches that were ever pitched to you, like, you could, like, basically whisper it on a rose and drop it in a well. Like, you know, <laughs> and I'm a father taking care of six uh, refugees. <laughs> and I run a laundromat <laughs> and just throw that, you know, like, in the well. Like, that's done. That'll never be used again, you know. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, ask, I, ask him know. about this because I'm going to ask him about something else I got. Go ahead. Mine is about your porn it. show. Oh, the porn uh, show. Oh, great. Dave's old, old porn. porn. And did you... Well, who first are those all, favorite favorite porn stars? But go ahead, say something first. Those were the seventies um, iconic age of porn, you know. Like, and um, you know, I knew them from the Aviana War. Like, I had like started doing it then with um, you know, and we we basically wanted the tribute to them because we got like I'm like the only idiot who bought the rights to to use these films because everybody would be like, why would you buy these rights? They're all like the mafia or something like that. So I bought the rights to these legendary films. And they're very dramatic and they're like acting and there's like car chases and all these weird things that you would never see on OnlyFans right now. So mm -hmm. these guys and ladies, they kind of built, you know, the renaissance of porn. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it was fun mm -hmm. to have them watch their things. And then we bring out the younger, the adult stars and they would also weigh in on it. And then there were comics that went on like Rogan, Bill Burr, um, so many great names that were on this thing. Amy Schumer, you know, like just like all the people I knew and like having mm -hmm. them like kind of throw, we throw them like, just like looking at it, uh, Marin, all these different people. And you would have been great at it, dude. You, uh, I love I that. Yeah. You're a porn guy. I don't think you're a porn guy. <laughs> so you think you can be able to, like, I like to just watch stuff and comment on it. That's funny. Well, there you go. VH1 style. <laughs> yeah, we could do <laughs> Tracy one, Lords. Remember, remember Tracy her? Tracy Lords, of course, yes. I mean, there was so many, so many names. And uh, that was for Showtime. And uh, I guess this was before, um, you know, uh, uh, what was their big show over there? Yeah. No, it was. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm trying to think. I'm not putting them It down. was the uh, uh, Christy Canyon had a sitcom over there. for. Well, West. what happened was it's like me and uh, my other guy who's a great guy, Jeremy. Uh, he's the editor and he was also the director of that. We we like threw everything we had into it because we believed in it. You know, we covered all the dirty stuff with like interesting yeah. graphics and like. Uh, at the end of the day, I lost money doing a TV show. It was like one of those like <laughs> too big to fail. Like it was just yeah. like I don't know. I was just a star of a TV show. I'm a hundred grand in the hole. How did that happen? You know? <laughs> I got the rights to seek his catalog. Yeah, yeah, it was like one of those things. So I, I'm just curious about insomnia because um, that I made money on, that... but I lost a kidney. So there you go. <laughs> You okay. lost a kidney? <laughs> no, no, it was a lot of drinking. I really drank on the show and oh, okay. it was a travel show and, you know, 
Uh, the people who helped me make that also just awesome people being like out all hours of the night for days and days at a time. And uh, that was my idea. That was uh, like, what happens after the show? You go out. And I also wanted to do late night jobs. So, you know, everything that we kind of did on that show became its own entity on other shows. And people are like, do you feel that, you know, yeah. you, it's like, I don't care. I don't care who's doing it, whatever. When I did it, uh, I did it the best I could. This was before cell phones. It would never work now with all of the technology. Well, you're and, the first uh, one. Honest, That's good. And to be honest, like, yeah. uh, you know, I think Anthony Bourdain did the ultimate travel show. Like the guy found what, it, what it's really about. Food is universal. And I always felt like, you know, this guy, people always like, hey, he's doing a travel. I was like, there's nothing like that show. That guy really, you know, he found the thing or that was his thing that like, I mean, you can't, you can't top what he did. So I'm just one of many travel shows of the, of the, of the time. So, well, well, that's Jeff, that's Jeff every Ross credit goes you bring out up, I, I belittle every, yeah, you're like, friend. this is shitty. That was horrible. Yeah, that, and well, then that happened. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm not really, I'm I not think really it was ahead of his time guy. to put a comic in that, those situations, improvising and being, yeah. re being real, authentic, you know, it was like, well, let's talk about comedy central. Cause that was like, I think the heyday of comedy central, the Chappelle show was killing us yes. to this day. I'd say probably the top, if not the top five, the top three of great sketch shows. I mean, Definitely. I mean, yeah. him and Neil, what they put together there. I mean, amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then my show was there. I felt like we were a utility show, you know, like we were like, they would always go like, okay, we need you to do this and this and this. I'm like, but it's snowing there. It's like, well, you got to do it, you know, because it was an outdoor show most of the mm -hmm. time. So it wasn't yeah. like we're always doing the spring break. So it was really tough on us weather wise. Sorry, mm -hmm. guys. Also yeah. running a... Bitcoin uh, factory here. So, <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So that was what that was. That was like the serious travel show. And I would do road after that. But here's the thing. You guys will love this. And I'm sorry if I'm babbling. because No, it's, it's, this is good. I, I, I get asked about the show all the time. But the real, the real deal is that a lot of the people who watched it were like in high school who couldn't go out yet. So that they, they I was always like, well, if this show is such a hit, how come the club isn't full? Or how come like, this tour is not making yeah. money. And it turns out they weren't old enough yet to go to see a live show. So uh -huh. years later, they all caught up with me and then some. But back then I was like, you know, I don't get it, man. I mean, where is everybody? Everybody's talking about it. I'm drinking with everybody. Like, what's going on here? And then it turned out they just weren't ready to, like, go to clubs yet. So that was it. So Comedy Central, so you had all Captain, my credits now. Captain, <laughs> yeah, Captain we did. Miserable. Dana. Road, Captain road miserable. work. I mean, These my specials. Your specials, the ugly American. That's why I did that for John Stewart. That was yeah. uh, my character. Daily and show. And now, of course, that one is uh, <clears throat> is uh, the ugly American. I I assume everybody considers us all ugly at this point. But uh, back then, it was a lot of fun because you could be inappropriate. You put John down. He always had a great sense of humor. So. And then you and you and Jeff Ross are a cool pair. Bumble. Yeah. Bumping. That marks. was another one. That was another thing. And uh, we wanted to get Dave on that for sure. Which, like we did the three or four, we did three episodes in New York at the Village Underground. And to be to be fair, it, you know, bumping mics, that's Jeff's idea. We just started doing it for fun at the end of the shows. He would come yeah. into town he'd on stage. I bring him on stage. We go at each other. And like, uh, you know, he's the roast master. We all know that. So, you know, um, it was great keeping up with Jeff and then like learning like how to work together it's really difficult as you know like to have another voice on stage and how to like you know yeah. back back and forth we got really good at it we toured a bit on it mm -hmm. and the shows that we did people still to this day come up and, and talk about that so i would say jeff is fearless everything i wanted to cut out of the thing he kept in and people loved it so he was uh, right and he was wrong yeah. and you know i guess at the end of the day i'm a coward because i'm like oh we're gonna get <laughs> we're gonna get we're gonna get blowback on this and then he's like what are you nuts i mean come on let's keep it in there so I always give it up to Jeff. Like, uh, you know, I guess he could see through the trees, whereas I was like, you know, we're, we're heading in <laughs> rocks. So. Yeah. I think you did it one night and brought me up and I sat there on the side with a mic with you guys. Is that possible? I I think so. Yeah. Do you remember where it was? Was it in, in New York or LA? No. It, it, is it possible? No, not Largo. I think it, it was We've somewhere where I. we Largo. We've never done Yeah. It. That was a trick and you've. You passed. Um, <laughs> no, I, maybe it was the comedy store. We've never done it there. Uh, maybe it was. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, it probably know. was the comedy store. So, you know, but yeah, 
both of you would be awesome because let's face it, the crowd is not just a fan of us, but of comedy. So they were like, right? They just what? they were great, and it's good if you're on the side because you guys talk and get and carry it, and then I just chirp in. Yeah, yeah. no, I remember now. It was it was we had a lot of really great. Uh, it was all because of Jeff because Jeff knows everybody. So we had the late great Bob Sackett, Gilbert, who we're both really good friends with. He, he did it, and then we had Bob Sackett and Gilbert together, which was like kind of a Kong versus Godzilla moment. It was like an awesome, <laughs> very similar. Two, <laughs> these two go at it, you know. Of course, and um, uh, what was the other? Bruce Willis was on it. I mean, like we had some really big names that came by, and that was all because of Jeff, you know. So far, nothing is because of you in this whole in your whole career. Yeah, I like to think I'm just kind of <laughs> like the. Uh, <laughs> I'm the ring around the bathtub. That's a lie. <laughs> Can I just ask you, uh, what do you, well, like what you're, you're going to tour all, all the time? Are you out now or what do you, how often are you going out and do you have a new half hour? <laughs> uh, yeah. What do you do with that? Much. That's great. <laughs> I think we talked about it at the, it's uh, horrible. At the, Tony, it's like, <laughs> he's already judged. Cause you need I about a hundred great jokes, No, it's right? so tough to, you need to do a hundred jokes I mean, to, to yeah. do jokes. I do chop broccoli for 19 minutes. That's boom. <laughs> <laughs> I, I repeat one phrase over and but guys like you or Larry Bubbles Brown, it's like really good jokes every 15 seconds, 20 seconds. Hard to get well, a half hour. Uh, I got about 15 minutes of okay. And then probably 30 of like, Hey, I'm trying up here, you know, but yeah, <laughs> I gave, a, I, I, you know, the, forgive the term. I shot my load on the last one. And like, I hadn't been in this situation in about four or five years where like you got nothing. And I talked to the young comics like Sam Morel, Mark Norman. These guys turn hours like now every like 13 months. They're yeah. like turning hours. And I'm like, Very tough. Yeah. and they also get it like, you know, yeah, when you got nothing and then you're going back out there, like you really like, you know, it's really a sad, like, you know, it's like God's love. Where is it? You know, like you're really there alone. <laughs> so, um, or, or, or you tip the crowd and say, hey, work in my work in my new hour. <laughs> yeah. Warning. Have you or, ever gone you know, up with notes then, like with a notepad, so they kind of know, uh, hey, I'm just, uh, that's what I do. Like, uh, hey, I, I don't know what's happening next, but I feel bad for the audience when I'm not. I, I like where you do that because uh, I think a lot of the crowd go like, oh, I'm getting to see the process. Yeah, they you do. Realize, wow, I really kind of would like a more finished thing, you know, because at yeah. the end of the day, you know, yeah, you but like, you guys are getting this stuff that, you know. But it's a good yeah. trick. It's a trick because they laugh hard. You're like, is this anything? Polished joke. I just go, you're going to hate <laughs> this bit, and then I'm going to tell it to you again and point out where, why and where you're going to hate it. So that <laughs> always helps the bit because they go, yeah, that's true. you tell us you're going to hate it. Ah, it's not too bad. But the uh, the the thing that I like is when, um, you know, I'll, uh, uh, you know, do the jokes that didn't make it, you know, and those are, that's, that people are like, why didn't that yeah, get in yeah. there? Like, Always gets a better laugh. They're like, that's not <laughs> yeah. that bad. So what's yeah. the most uh, money you've made in one single uh, calendar year? <laughs> what? Me? Is that what you <laughs> Oh, you take cute questions from the audience. <laughs> no, I'm gonna I was asking you. I'm all I'm I'm really into celebrity net worth and stuff, but I'm just okay. Well, you, don't have to, to, you don't have to answer I'm, that. The thing is, I'm making millions more than I actually am. But I'm on tour because. My mom has round the clock care. She has dementia, which is very expensive. Mm. And, you know, we wanted her to have another disease, which is less. Good job, Dana. But that's what she's going with. So this is um, real. This is real this stuff. Is yeah. So part of it is like, you know, I'll never quit. You know, I'm a road. The other part of me is like, I got these bills. You know, I got I more. can't quit. So, so that's part of it. And like, uh, you know, the other thing is um, I really wouldn't know what to do with myself if I wasn't out there. But I would say that, um, you know, as long as I'm still, um, you know, everything gets harder, but the actual show, like the flights, the hotels, mm -hmm, all right. the food, all that kind of stuff, you know, poor us, that's our lives. But it really does kind of grind down on you. But the shows for me, like, it's like, yeah, there's good ones, there's bad ones. But like, as long as I'm coming up with one new thing, then you're like, okay, I guess I'm yep. still able to do this. So, you know. Yep. That is fun. Getting ideas is one of the fun things left in life. If you get a good oh, idea. A positive coming out of old Dave. It's, uh, a, it's a good code to crack. If you can still go come up with a bit and they just go, Oh fuck. Oh, this is cool. Oh. And then it works. And you're like, that gives you a little, uh, juice. I Everybody think. says that me. everybody, Bob Newhart would say that you do your same old set. You try one joke out or bit. And if it works, you're just kind of like, Oh, that, 
that was a great night. You know, it's fun. I got a new, I got a new toy. So you can still do it. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I go back to Chris Rock for what you were saying. It's like, it's a job like Lauren Michael. What do you think of Lauren Michaels? I think he gave me a job. And so the fact is you're still in demand and mm-hmm. people want to pay you money to go do your thing. So why stop? That's nice. Well, are you enjoying it now that like, you know, you can just go out and, you know, like, I guess basically do whatever you feel like doing, you know, there's really no pressure now, like that you're able to just go out there and, and like enjoy it. You know, so many, so many years it's either about like, you know, I got to do this because it might lead to this, all that kind of stuff. Like for you guys, especially yeah. like just go out and have fun with it. Right. Yeah. It's just some days I wake up. I just, I just want to get on Southwest today. It's <laughs> enjoyable. Yeah. I don't travel that much, but yeah, in the early days, it's painful to even think about uh, the amount of stage fright I had and the amount of fear. Really? Oh yeah, I was terrified um, for years. Wow. Yeah, I mean during college days, and Rob Williams would was there in the beginning, and then he went and got more committee, but he was always coming back, and it was so powerful and so explosive. It was just sort of like oh, it's shit. hard to compete with. I got unfollowable. But, but would you say like at his heyday, like there's yeah. no way anybody can follow him, right? No, because he yeah. he always thought he he apologized to me once, like he, he took something from me. I I go, I try to take your whole act. I mean, he came up with <laughs> others did it. Talk about influence. He came up with this conceit of a Shakespearean actor that has no act, and they just yeah. pushed him out on stage, and it, and then he learned how to do that. But that spontaneity, and, oh, and j- go and jump in the audience at the time. I remember Gary Shandling's thinking, why why am I even trying? Why, why, why am I doing this? this Are we in the same business? Tornado, yeah. but it did make you work harder. You're like, okay, that's the level of killing. Cause in those days you just wanted to just kill. And so yeah. Robin did sort of make you go, okay, I got, I got, I got to get better. So that was the good side of it. But yeah. it's, it seems like every laugh was a home run with him, or at least that's what, you know, you see when you look at those old yeah. tapes, just like, it was just crush, crush, crush. Like Jim Carrey, another guy, like, Crush, crush, crush. There had to be in the beginning, especially times where people were just kind of like he was ahead of the crowd. They didn't get him, right? Like immediately, did they or did they? Sometimes Robin would come into the Holy City Zoo, the 60-seater in San Francisco in the late 70s. And, you know, he'd do two hours. And in those days, he was kind of drinking and stuff. And sometimes mm-hmm. people would start to walk out after it just because he was just out there. But I think sure. his rhythm, wherever his voice came from, he's from Detroit and Marin County. But this sort of like this voice was and right now there's a man going, hello. And after a while, you're just seduced by it. I was on stage mm-hmm. doing improv and once and he's going right now, there's a man going, the man going, whoa. And, and there, he didn't have a line. <laughs> he still got. A yeah, line. yeah. But it sounds physical, like a joke. The voice was so and then he, he wouldn't really use the mic was also another thing. He'd stand away from the mic. Oh, hello. Ha, ha. And, and this sense of like he didn't know what was going to happen. And so. It was a yeah, nice cool one too. of those shooting stars. Good presence, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's another thing. That's it's like you know, it took me a little while to get comfortable, and it took me another while to like figure out what I'm doing. But there are people who are just gifted, who like immediately, boom, they got it. That's who they are, and then they run towards it. You know, so like uh, this, just like I, I mean, there's a, definitely a, a deep bench of guys who and women who are just that good at it. You know, I don't know. Uh, I, mean, I don't know. I well, well you should watch your own special because <laughs> yeah, Dave's one of the best. Uh, I, I, that special, I would, I, I happily recommend it to our listeners. Yeah. Just go on it Netflix. It means a lot coming from you guys, you know. And um, I hope this podcast is successful. I mean, eventually you'll get those stands that other podcasts have for the microphones instead of this morning radio kind of feel. You that fucking you have. motherfucker. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> our parent company is in bankruptcy, so we, we we're we're on a budget. <laughs> I'm at a Holiday Inn. Yeah, that's a set, Dave. Yeah. All right, well, Dave. Thank you for coming yes. out, buddy. Hey, uh, let's let's make a plan. If I'm ever that way, you guys, please come on one of my shows, and I'd love to be a part of whatever you guys are doing. I would love to. I'd love to see you in person, Dave. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you, Dana. Yeah. Dave, Pleasure. All right. Bye, Pleasure. Dave. Pleasure. Hot Cross Bye. Buns, Netflix. This has been a presentation of Odyssey. Please follow, subscribe, leave a like, a review, all the stuff, smash that button, whatever it is, wherever you get your podcasts. Fly on the Wall is executive produced by Dana Carvey and David Spade, Jenna Weiss Berman of Odyssey, Charlie Finan of Brillstein Entertainment, and Heather Santoro. The show's lead producer is Greg Holtzman. <laughs>